since I don't trust it, I'm going to double check it. It's running, so there shouldn't be a problem. So I should be able to post that up. And um, we'll go ahead. If there's no questions, concerns, we'll jump into Chapter 2. Oh, uh, chapter 3, thank you. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and let's take a look. And uh, we had left off at the... Uh, first few slides here that we got through chapter three talking about cash and cash equivalents remember we said that what money in a checking account is cash money in a savings account money market account all of that's cash right it doesn't have to be you know for, you know Benjamin's in a drawer somewhere in order to be cash uh, but we also talked about cash equivalents and remember we said things that are highly li liquid like treasury bills certificate of deposit that have what have an original maturity to the purchaser of 90 days or less. And remember, we went through the process and we looked at even one of the questions from the homework, um, talking, not the homework, but the quiz, talking about um, the uh, how that worked out in terms of uh, the original date of purchase for the purchaser, right? So you could have a security maturing on the same date, but if the purchaser didn't purchase with the intent of holding it for 90 days, then it's not a cash equivalent. Still a current asset though, right? Okay. Now, um, when I said homework, that uh, interrupted my flow of thinking a little bit. I also put the homework for Chapter 3 there now because I wasn't there on Thursday, on Tuesday, ah, Monday. What school am I at today? San Jose State. So it's either Monday or Wednesday. So I put it up there Monday. Okay. Um, again, homework is not required. Okay. But uh, I do think you should really think about getting the textbook and stuff uh, for this particular class. But it's not required. You'll get the points as long as you're here, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now, when we take a look at this slide, uh, sir, was there a question about the cash equivalent? You looked at me for a minute like I said something that didn't didn't hang for you okay all right good so don't don't hesitate to ask if you have a question you can see me after okay all right so what happens it could be that a company has restricted their cash for some purpose why would a company restrict their cash you're sitting there saying hey this is a current asset cash is king you should be able to spend it on anything you want why would there be a restriction why would a company place a restriction as to the use of their cash? What would cause a company to do that? Okay, maybe they think there's a downturn. They want to hold their cash position, right? Um, now, the situation is that they want their shareholders potentially to know that they're not planning on paying dividends out anytime soon, right? Because they got this restriction for cash downturn maybe they're restricting the cash for a long-term purpose like to purchase some equipment maybe their equipment's getting a little depreciated and they've decided hey we're going to start to set aside some cash for that eventual uh big out big purchase that's coming out for equipment and they don't want the shareholders to just look at this cash and think well why is the company hoarding cash and should be paying a dividend so they often will go ahead and restrict the cash and if it's restricted for um a non-current purpose you have to take it out of the current asset and literally show it as a non-current asset. So what we're thinking could be that should be the most current of your assets, your cash, could be contained in the non-current asset section of the balance sheet. Now, connected to this discussion, but typically the way textbooks do this is they wait until you get into a whole nother class where they talk about retained earnings and something that we call appropriation of return of retained earnings. Okay, so if we have unappropriated retained earnings on our balance sheet. Let's say we have cash and say the cash is a hundred thousand. I'm not going to deal with any other assets or liabilities. I'm just your stockholders' equity. I'm simply going to make my retained earnings a hundred thousand, right? But let's say we decide, you know what? We better restrict $25,000 of that cash because that cash needs to be set aside for purchase of equipment or something, right? Then the journal entry there would to be to do what? To debit restricted cash. What did I say, guys? 25000 Debit restricted cash, 25000 and credit unrestricted cash would have 25,000. So now up on the balance sheet we'll have what? 
we'll have regular cash at 75,000. And in the non-current asset section, I guess this would be current, we will literally show what? Cash hyphen restricted for $25,000, right? Because we just put that into the restricted cash category. Okay. Now, that's sort of what you're seeing up here where they've shown some cash restricted. Okay. Now, what happens? What we're not talking about in this chapter, and we'll get to really more in intermediate two, there would also be a journal entry to appropriate the retained earnings. Okay. So this retained earnings would have been labeled unappropriated. And so what we'll do, and I'm just going to put the journal entry again right here in the middle of the balance sheet, we would go ahead and debit the unappropriated retained earnings for, what's the amount, 25000 and credit appropriated retained earnings for 25000 So now, when we prepare the balance sheet, we'll have what? We'll have unappropriated of 75000 and appropriated retained earnings of 25000 And, of course, there'll be a footnote next to both of these, the restricted cash and the unappropriated, in which the user of the financial statements would be able to go down there and read the footnote and say, Oh, okay, they're putting aside some cash for purchase of equipment, whatever it is the restriction is for, right? They could read about that. That takes away the situation where the shareholders might be looking at the financial reports and saying, well, how come you haven't paid a dividend? Oh, I see. You got the cash up there, but it's being set aside for some purpose, for long-term purpose, purchase of equipment or whatever. Okay? Any question? Okay, good. Now, you come over and uh, we talk about short-term investments, what happens here. With short-term investment, companies putting their money into some sort of stock um, could be a uh, debt security of some sort of note or something like that, and they're going to not meet the criteria of cash equivalent, of course, so we're going to list it under the category of investment, short-term investments. Now, when we take our investments, we put them into two, uh, our short-term investments, we put them into two broad categories, could be trade, well, really, there's three. Trading, available for sale, which is available for stock investment, equity investments, and then you could also have held to maturity. Held to maturity security is only available for what? Debt securities, because stocks don't have maturity, right? Okay, so you have the three categories, but right now we're talking about trading <clears throat> and available for sale securities. Now, what happens? If you hold a security as a trading security, that security needs to be marked to fair market value on the balance sheet each period. Okay? Slides don't let me write on them properly. Fair market value on the balance sheet every period. Okay? So if it goes up in value, we're going to debit the security, write it up. If it goes down in value, we're going to credit the security to write it down. Okay? Now, when you have gains and losses, obviously, if the fair market value of the security goes up from period one to period two, you have a gain. If you have a gain in value and, and uh, losses in value, gains and losses in value go directly to the income statement. Okay, so let's see if I can keep the example. Thank you, sir. Did, uh, I think there's one person that just came in that didn't, didn't you got you got it. Thank you. I've got the, uh, the man of the hour here helping me do this, so I appreciate that. Okay. All right, good. So what's happening? Julie? Peter? Julie's here? Oh, okay. Uh, Peter? Karandeep? Okay. There's people are going to be getting an email from me. Can't be missing class. Cannot be missing class. Or maybe they're going to drop or something. I'm sorry. What's your name? Christina. Um, so what on the fair market value on the balance sheet. On the balance sheet. Yeah. Sorry. 
uh, you know, if you can't read my writing, just ask me just like that. I try to repeat it um, on the balance sheet. Um, I never had good writing. The teachers, when I was like, when they first start making you, I guess past kindergarten, first grade, they start making you write, and they would always send notes home. We're concerned about John. He can't stay in the lines, okay? And so I've never been able to. I still can't. Um, I'm getting old. I got what they call a neuropoly, so I can't feel the outside part of my hand anymore. You add this uh, funky pen situation to it. You add the fact that for some reason these slides are very temperamental about me writing on them. They want to change over right away, and you've got hieroglyphics as the result of all that. So if you can't read, I try to call it out, but if you can't read it, just ask me, okay? Okay, there was when I worked, all those years I worked for the GAO. There was one person, her name was Yola Lewis. Somehow she could read my writing. I don't know how. So I would give her something and she would be reading it and then I'd come back and I'd look at my own thing and I'd say, Yola, what did this say? Okay, so she would be able to tell me. Okay, so what happens? You have fair market value um, on the balance sheet and then gains and losses go directly to the income statement. Okay, so I'm going to try to do my example right here. And so let's say we have a security. We'll make it a stock. And at 1231, why is it doing that? 1231, um, we'll say 18, whatever, doesn't matter. 1231, 18, the stock has a fair, has a original cost. Okay. I'm not going to fight it. I'm going to come out of slideshow mode because it seems to work better. I don't know. They've got some sort of hex on these slides that they want to change on me. And there's probably a way of taking it off, but I don't know how to do it. So I'm going to discard this. Okay. So at 12, 31, 18, we have a stock. original cost equals say a hundred thousand and at 1231 18 uh, fair market value is ninety thousand now this stock's lost value hasn't it can it happen unfortunately it does right okay so what would we do we would go ahead and we would literally have to book a journal entry here which is to credit the stock investment, which is a current asset on the balance sheet. What do I got, a $10,000 loss here? For $10,000 and debit loss on investment for $10,000. Now, when we prepare our income statement obviously on the balance sheet it's now being carried at what the fair market value of 90,000 right hello right because I just credited it for 90 on the income statement I'm going to show my revenue whatever that is show my expenses whatever that is that difference gives me what operating income And then I'll have my non-operating section. And in my non-operating section, I'm going to show what? Loss on investment, whatever. And I may give more detail. I might say loss on investment of trading security, whatever. Okay, there's FASB does not get that much up in our face as to exactly how we call things out on the income statement. So we've got a lot of latitude there. So sometimes you'll get confused because you'll see an example of an income statement. You'll say, well, it didn't say loss on from trading security, but we looked at another one that said loss on investment for trading security. Do you have to call it out or not? And the answer is no, you don't have to, but you can, right? Okay, but it's obviously what? $10,000? With me so far? Okay. Now, what happens? We get into year two. Now, remember, guys, we're talking about trading security here. And we get into year two. And in year two, I think I like being out of slide mode better. You can see it all right, right? I think it's much more flexible with the colors and stuff. In year two, then, let's say 
now the fair market value of the security, and I guess you can guess where I'm going with this, fair market value of the security, say, equals 120. Has it gained? It's what? It's recovered all previous losses, and it's gained what? Another 20,000, hasn't it? Okay. Now, if that's the case, okay, when it comes back, I will go ahead and I will debit security, and this is now year two. That's what I'm doing in red. I will debit security for what it's gained, 30,000? Investment security, whatever, that same account. What was it? Stock investment, okay. Stock investment, I'll debit for 30, and I'll credit what? Gain on investment for 30,000. Okay, and so I'm not going to prepare the financial reports again. I think you get it. Now the security would be what? Showing 120, it's fair market value, and what? The income statement would show a $30,000 gain. Okay, now that's my what? Trading security. How do I know if I have a trading security? It's a trading security if I'm trading it actively. So every day I'm going and I'm trading. It doesn't have to be that specific security, but I'm trading securities actively every day. Well, actually, you would do it by security, but I'm trading it actively every day. That doesn't mean I have to trade it every day, but I'm certain, certainly looking for opportunities to take investment gains and losses on those daily. So it makes sense to run it through the income statement with me so far. Okay. Now, I'm going to erase all this. Some securities... Are called held to maturity securities. Now, the only ones that can be called held to maturity securities are what? Our stocks, I mean, our, our debt securities, our bonds, whatever. Stocks cannot be held to maturity because they have no maturity, right? So, if we're talking about a debt security like a bond, we will carry it at amortized cost. Amortized cost means that it's what? Going to be the face plus the premium, the face minus the discount, whatever, and we'll amortize that premium discount per, uh, periodically, and we'll call it uh, that we're call, carrying it at amortized cost. If that's the case, there are no unrealized holding gains and losses. Change in market value have absolutely no effect on the carrying value of the security, and therefore there are no gains and losses, right? Okay, we just simply amortize the discount, amortize the premium. Now, any security that is not considered trading security or we have not categorized it as held to maturity, by the way, to be held to maturity, the company has to have the positive intent and ability to hold that security to maturity. Okay, intent um, is one thing, ability is another. If they're in a situation where they're going to have to somehow start to liquidate investments, then we don't consider them having the ability to hold that to maturity. Intent is much harder for us as auditors, if you're thinking from an auditor standpoint, to get to. I mean, how am I going to audit management's intent? Hold still. Okay, I feel your intent. Okay, doesn't work that way. So we have something called a management representation letter in auditing, and this is not an auditing class, but in the management representation letter in auditing, we make them put in writing their intent and ability to hold held to maturity securities to maturity, and we make them sign that letter. It's signed by the CFO, CEO. So we have some audit evidence as to their intent for those securities that they're putting into held to maturity category. Because think about it, there's an advantage to held to maturity because you don't have to take those annoying gains and losses every period fluctuating your income all over the place right okay so you have what one year we showed a ten thousand dollar loss next period we're showing a thirty thousand dollar gain period after that we're showing a ten thousand dollar loss all of a sudden our income looks like a drunken sailor doesn't it and do companies want their income statement to look their net income to look like a drunken sailor they do not. They like a nice, steady little line going up, don't they? Okay. So in order for a company to keep the security in the held to maturity uh, category, we're going to make them put that in writing. Okay. Again, intermediate. I don't know. Maybe chapter 12. Maybe chapter 12 we get into some of that too in terms of uh, how to deal with held to maturity securities. Okay. So you're saying, can you get to the point, please? Okay. So if you're not trading, you're not held to maturity, you are available for sale. 
Okay, so companies categorize into two other categories, and then the stepchildren who don't fall into any category go where? Go into available for sale. Now, how does that work? Well, we mark fair market value on um, what's BS? on the balance sheet, fair market value in the balance sheet, okay? So again, same idea, if the security was what? Was 100,000, it came down to 90,000, we'd show it at 90,000 on the balance sheet, right? Okay, the question becomes, what happens to that 10,000, okay? And if it's held in maturity security, we have two options. One would be to put the, what they call unrealized, gain loss in something called other comprehensive income okay we would put that unrealized in this case loss in something called other comprehensive income other comprehensive income so there would be just going back to our first year, our year one example, uh, with that same same numbers we were talking about before, we would debit other comprehensive loss ten thousand and credit the security. It's not going to let me write down there. Where am I going to put my credit here? Credit the security. Sorry, guys. Just a little trouble fitting in. Credit the security for 10000 I'd be writing this on the board, but I'm thinking if you're watching the video later, you'd like to see the, the numbers. So that's why I'm trying to keep it on the screen. But we debit other comprehensive income, and we credit security for 10000 So the security is now 90000 on the balance sheet, isn't it? Okay. Now, when I go to prepare my income statement... I'll show revenue, whatever that is. I'll show expenses, whatever that is. Difference between revenue and expenses is what? Huh? Difference between revenue and expenses is what here? Operating income. Good, we just said that. Thank you. Whatever that is. Then I come over to my non-operating. And for this situation, I show nothing. Whatever. I would just show nothing. I don't have any non-operating items in this example. And then I would show what? Net income. Whatever that net income happens to be, notice this loss of 10000 is not showing in the non-operating section on my income statement like it was for the trading security. Okay. Now, you come over. There was a rumor that I should be able to write on this side. There it is. It was a true rumor. Someone told me you can write on the whatever margin when you're out of slideshow mode. And now I'm going to have something called a... Uh, now I'm going to have something called a comprehensive that says comprehensive, what's IS? Income statement. Okay, this box is supposed to be my comprehensive income statement. And on my comprehensive income statement, I will start with net income. What was my net income? XXX. And then I'll show the what? Loss on AFS security. And my loss on my AFS security is how much here? 10000 And then my bottom line here is called comprehensive income. And my comprehensive income, well, I can't. I can't say it'd be 10000 because I don't know what my net income was, but I would add my net income to my other comprehensive income, and that becomes my comprehensive income.
right? I add my net income to my other comprehensive income. That becomes my comprehensive income. You guys wanted to be accountants. Don't blame me. You got to start talking that way. Yeah. For the um, trading security, in both cases, we credited the security account to bring it down to 90. Because notice on the balance sheet, um, fair market value on the balance sheet. Remember, she asked me, what is it? Why are you saying how or whatever? And it was on. Okay, so uh, fair market value on balance sheet in both cases. In both cases. On the trading security, we credited the loss on investment, and that loss on investment appears on the income statement. Here, you know, in our general ledger, we'd have to be careful to credit not that same loss because, hey, there could be lots of losses hitting these accounts, right? So we'd have to have a separate account that's called other comprehensive loss. That line item gets reported on the comprehensive income statement. Comprehensive income statement starts with net income and then starts to put things on there that we call other comprehensive income items. And there are a variety of them. This is probably the most famous and unfortunately the easiest to understand that I'm talking to you about right now. There are other, other comprehensive income items that we may or may not touch on in this, in this class. Okay, but it's a different GL account. Absolutely, that's a good question. Okay. Okay, good. Now you're saying, well, why do we have to do this nonsense? What's going on? Well, a long time ago, users of financial reports complained to FASB. And they said, look, FASB, you're driving us nuts. We understand the income statement. But then you've got these things like these unrealized losses on available for sale securities that end up and they would dump them straight into stockholders' equity. They would bypass the income statement. And users were like, we don't want to be propeller head accountants, man. Can you do us a favor? Can you show us how those things would affect net income if they had hit the income statement? And FASB said, okay, we'll do that. But then what? FASB has many children, the users of the financial statements, the prepare the financial statements. Remember I talked to you about the business roundtable and the financial executive institute who get all steamed when FASB starts changing charts and make changes to their financial reports that they don't like. And they started saying, uh -huh, leave the income statement alone. So FASB says, okay, 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 look, all of you stop crying, right? One kid stops, the other one starts, right? All of you kids stop crying. Leave your income statement alone, but what we're going to do is we're going to create a new, a new statement, not a new income statement, but a new statement that we'll call what? The comprehensive income statement. The income statement's left alone, isn't it? It still shows net income. Pick the net income up, start there, and then start bringing these things in that go into other comprehensive income, and we'll take our net income and our plus our other comprehensive income. We call that what? comprehensive income the two things together okay now what happens you come to the end of the year you close your revenues you close your expenses into retain earnings right you all went back and looked at that little example that we had year one year two right so you're happy you're comfortable with closing entries and all that now okay so we would have gone through and we would have done that process but now we have to close our other comprehensive income item that's showing up on our comprehensive income statement, isn't it? Isn't it a line item on an income statement type item? It's a temporary account. So we have to close that. So what do we do? Since this was a what? Originally a debit to other comprehensive loss, to, to close it, we will do what? Credit, good, other comprehensive loss. I guess San Jose State would get mad at me if I wrote on the wall, right? Okay. Credit that for 10000 so now that account is closed. Okay. And I will debit an account called accumulated
and I'm just going to abbreviate it, and I know I misspelled accumulated. Accumulated OCI. I'm going to debit an account called accumulated OCI. OCI is what? Other comprehensive income. Okay. And I would go ahead and I would debit that for 10000 with me so far. Okay. Now, when I prepare my financial statement, what's going to happen? My balance sheet now. We've already kind of seen the income statement, but let's take a look at the balance sheet. Security is showing at 90000 isn't it? Now, I'm going to assume that before we started this whole thing, the balance sheet balanced. And all we had in our stockholders' equity section was retained earnings of 100000 If there's been no net income, is retained earnings still 100000 If there's been no net income, is retained earnings still 100000 Hello? Retain earnings is still 100000 because we didn't have net income. We close our revenue. We close our expenses to income summary. It goes into retain earnings, and we had no revenue, no expenses, whatever, which we'll assume in this case I should have probably put revenue expenses are zero. Net income is zero. Comprehensive income is what? Comprehensive loss is 10000 so comprehensive income is 10000 Okay, but uh, since I forgot to... Uh, to uh, have them be zeros, that's all right, but the revenue expenses are zero, so retainer only stays the same, doesn't it? Okay, okay, good. Then I'll report accumulated OCI, and I report my accumulated OCI, and I debited it, didn't I? So when it's down here in stockholders' equity, it's a minus, isn't it? Does the balance sheet bounce? Okay. It used to be that they would take that $10,000 loss and debit it straight to the accumulated other comprehensive income. And users didn't like that because users said, okay, <laughs> we see the security came down, but why? What was it? Now we reported on that what? That statement of comprehensive income so they can see it right there and how it affected net income, right? Okay. Now, I think you know where I'm going with this next thing. I'm going to put the screen up because I know you may can't see everything I wrote over here, and then I write over here, and people can't see it over here, and blah, blah. And we go to the next year, and the thing comes back what? thing comes back to 120, so we have a gain now. Okay? So we will do what? We'll credit security for 30,000. What is it called? Investment security? Investment stock? I, I forget what I call the thing. Security, investment stock, whatever. 30,000. We'll credit OCI, but now it's an OCI gain, isn't it? Of 30,000? We'll prepare the income statement. I'm not going to write it. We'll show an OCI gain down on the other comprehensive income statement now, won't we? So our comprehensive income will be 30000 And then we'll go ahead and we'll do what? We will show our balance sheet. Balance sheet will show now stock, whatever, investment for, what is it, 120 now? My retained earnings, still no action in there, is still 100000 isn't it? And when I do my closing entries, of course, I will do what? I will debit OCI gain for what? For the 30. That says gain. To close that for 30,000, I'll credit what? I'll credit the accumulated OCI, AOI. AOCI, accumulated other comprehensive income, for 30. When I credit it, if my AOCI had a debit balance of 10 and I now credit it for 30, what's the balance in it now? I got a credit of 20,000, so I put that on the balance sheet AC, uh, other comprehensive. O A A O C I um, is now what? Twenty thousand. Does the balance sheet bounce? Okay.
so much for making it easier to see. Okay. Question? So I did that for nothing? Yeah. Accumulated other comprehensive income? You don't, if you shave your head, you can say it a lot faster. There's no distractions of hair. Everything just flies out. It's great. Between other comprehensive income is like an income statement account. It's a temporary account. It's like revenue. It's like expense. It's like gains. It's like losses, right? Which we will close those back to zero at the end of each year. The accumulated other comprehensive income is like the retained earnings of our other comprehensive incomes items. That's where they go to sleep at night on the balance sheet, right? Or the end of the year on the balance sheet. Okay, so OCI is on the statement of comprehensive income. AOCI is on the balance sheet, right? It's like the retained earnings of the other comprehensive income items. So revenue, expenses, gains, and losses are to retain earnings as other comprehensive income items are to accumulate it other comprehensive income. Sounds like some weird logic situation. Question? You'd be better off asking me. She probably doesn't know what I wrote either. Question about what this says up here? How did I get the 20000 Debit on the left, credit on the right, balance. Debit, credit, balance, right? I mean, to be more consistent, I probably should have written the 30000 down here, wrote the 20000 down here, and wrote 10000 here so it looks like a general ledger. Yeah, there's no parentheses around it, which means in, you know, in accounting, um, you know, we have the common balance for our um, assets, our uh, debits, so we don't show parentheses on them. If we do have something that's a credit in the asset section, we tend to put parentheses around it to show that it's a subtract, for example, accumulated depreciation. When we're in the liability section, the normal balance is credits. If we do have a liability, which would be almost impossible, I'm having trouble thinking of a liability that would be a debit, then we would put parentheses around if it was a debit. In our stockholders' equity section, which tends to be credits, if we have things that have debit balances down there, we tend to put parentheses around them. So this is a plus. Okay. I'm not sure who came first. Go ahead. Yeah. He doesn't care either. All the, the whole other comprehensive losses, I mean, that's just for the available for sale uh, section, right? Not for, like, the ones that are in Trading? Yeah. Trading, uh, unrealized holding gains and losses go straight to the income statement. I erased it now. Yeah, trading goes straight to the income statement. The accumulated other comprehensive income uh, and the co other comprehensive income approach that I'm speaking to you about now is shown for, is used for the available for sale, although there are other things that could affect other comprehensive income. For example, when you have pensions, pensions are scary because a change in actuarial assumptions for a company can create this gigantic loss all of a sudden. And if FASB approach was that you just plop that loss onto the income statement, it could potentially wipe out retained earnings because you all of a sudden have this change in actuarial assumption. Gee, we thought everybody was going to live to 50, but we looked down a little bit more and I think they might make it to 80. 
So that could, you know, if an actuary was doing that, they'd be drunk. But, you know, if you have something like that, FASB does wants, just wants to get companies because that all used to be off the balance sheet. They simply want them to start to get those things onto the balance sheet. But they sit there and they say because that could have such an ominous effect on the balance sheet if you put it there all at once, what we'll let you do is trickle it onto the income statement slowly and we'll show certain balances and accumulated other comprehensive income so that it doesn't wipe out your retained earnings. So there's stuff like that, way beyond the scope of this class. That's way, that's your misery, I mean your thing you'll learn in chapter uh, in, uh, intermediate two. But yes, for what we're talking about now, the trading versus available for sale, it is simply on the um, for the available for sale securities. Held to maturity securities, they're carried in amortized cost, aren't they? So amortized cost means what? We'll show them what our cost was if we bought a bond for 100000 and we have a discount on the bond of 10000 just to make up a number. We show that discount, and then the carrying value of the bond is what? $90,000, isn't it? Okay. If our cash interest is 2500 but our effective interest using the market rate to calculate the interest is, and I'm just making these numbers up, guys, uh, 2600 then we have what? We have a $100 difference between our cash interest and our effective interest that's showing up on our income statement is our interest expense. And so if that's the case, then when you record your interest payment, you would credit cash for 2500 You would debit your interest expense for what, 2600 Because that's your actual interest. And then you go ahead and you credit this discount for the $100 difference. Now, when you credit the discount, the discount was a debit, wasn't it? Going against the, uh, the bond pay. And this is for our, um, for our bond payable. Oh, no, actually, this is our bond investment, right? So I got this backwards. Sorry, guys, because we're talking investments. And in the middle of this, I started talking about interest expense. So if our cash interest is 2,500, but our effective interest earning is 2,600, the company that we're holding the bond for is going to pay us $2,500 cash, but we'll credit interest revenue for 26. And then we go ahead, and we don't really show it as a, we just show the bond investment for. Uh, we show it net of any discounted premium, so we show it for 90000 So we would go ahead and debit the investment for the $100 difference so that this journal entry balances, and the bond investment comes up to what? Comes up to a, um, whatever it would be, ten uh, $100 more, 90100 at this point. And so we just carry up that amortized cost, and there's no... And meanwhile, the fair market value of the bond, I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but the fair market value of the bond could be 120. It wouldn't matter. We'd still carry the bond at its what? Amortized cost, which at this point would be what? 110 after we make that entry, uh, 90,100 uh, after we make that entry on the board that I showed over there. Okay, that's amortized cost. That's for held to maturity securities. Okay. So, but don't worry about that right now. Just let's get back to what this slide is about, which is those investments that are uh, trading securities available for sale securities. It's the approach that we've just been practicing with. Okay. Okay. Questions about this one, sir? It's all right. You don't have to let it go. Just <laughs> go for it. No. No, that's, you know, can vary by company to company, but it's kind of like, um, how can I put it, you know, uh, general, uh, remember we talked about um, a little bit about the gap hierarchy where FASB was the th main thing, but then they allowed us for prevailing practices. So that's kind of a prevailing practice thing that most companies do. So an auditor might say to a company, you know, 
showing that minus sign next to it is kind of not the best presentation issue. It's not something that we would, what we call modify our opinion over. Modified opinion says that there's something material that the auditor does not agree with on the financial reports, and we wouldn't do that for the parentheses thing. But it'd be weird if a company did that, and you'd probably be, be, you know, you'd probably go up to the board directors, put it in what they call a management letter. Management letter is things that, eh, they're not material. We're not going to hold up the show about it, but it really warrants your attention. And trust me, board directors don't like letters from auditors like that. And so they'd probably call the CFO in and say, what is this? What is this? And when he, you, he explained or she explained why she was insisting on negative signs, they'd say, okay, put parentheses on it. It's one of those kind of things. Okay, okay good. Any questions? Is there, I thought I saw one other over here. No, we're good now? Okay. All right, good. Now, having said all that, there is something called the fair market value option for available for sale securities that if the company wants to, they can treat it like a trading security. So after all that with the other comprehensive income, if they decide they don't want to do that, then they can treat it as what? available for sale security okay and if they decide to change that it's like any accounting change they would have to disclose that and put some pretty bright lines of disclosure around it so if you're thinking oh okay so when times are good and there's gains let's put it on the income statement when things are soon there's losses let's put it on the other comprehensive income statement no okay if they want to change from one period to the next if they want to change from year one to year two they have to have good reason they have to say that it would provide what better financial reporting and then it's pretty hard for them to flip that back after they've made the case that year one to change it to the other so okay good all right so with all that let's take a look at Um, these uh, cash, cash equivalent, short-term investments, sometimes in the notes, they'll give you the details as to what these are. If you add up these numbers, they come to this total, right? So they don't list every single security there. Okay. Okay, good. Accounts receivable. Okay. Again, accounts receivable is a current asset. And note, guys, that often they'll show the accounts and notes receivable, and you'll see net there. That means it is net of the allowance for doubtful accounts. Remember our little magnet game? You guys had that all down pat as to how that works, okay? And then in the footnote, often they'll show the allowance. Now, I noticed when I looked at uh, Apple's, You know, I looked and looked for the note that showed what the uh, that showed what the allowance was, and I couldn't find it. So that might be something uh, you might want to help me out with, is to get a look at Apple's financial reports and see if you can find that. I looked and looked for that note. I couldn't find it. They just showed it net, but I did not see the note that showed what the allowance is. Uh, again, we worry about what materiality in these things so if it's not material then they don't necessarily have to disclose it so I saw the net on the balance sheet I could not find a note that talked about what the allowance was so okay. but typically this is what you see you see the allowance down here that shows the net okay yeah okay from the side, it looked like that wasn't balancing. I was going, like, what the heck's going on here, right? Okay. Okay, good. Okay, inventories are a current asset, aren't they? Okay, so we'll show those, whatever they are, current assets. Um, if you are a manufacturer, and in this class, guys, we pretty much assume 
uh, retail entities. Okay, the way accounting is typically taught, studied, it's retail gets in your financial accounting classes, and then manufacturers get in your cost accounting, your managerial accounting. Okay, but if you were a manufacturer, then you would be showing your inventories in these different categories. Inventories go from what? From raw materials to work in progress to finished goods, right? If you're a manufacturer. Okay. Okay, good. Um, here we're showing our inventory and we're telling you that it is using the inventory method FIFO, first in, first out. We will study those in other chapters. Okay, it'll be uh, similar to what you had in Business 20, although there's some uh, bells and whistles that we'll start to study in this class. But inventory is a current asset, obviously. Prepaid expenses. Insurance is a prepaid expense. Uh, what? Rent can be a prepaid expense, etc. Okay, good. You guys know that. Okay, let's look at this question and uh, remember that we had talked about the operating cycle of a company and we said the operating cycle is what? One year or um, current assets are used up in what? Either the operating cycle or one year, whichever is longer. So if we have an entity that has a longer operating cycle, we'd want to know that so that we could list things that are going to be used up in that longer period as not as uh, non-current, right? Okay. And so, or excuse me, as current, as current. So let's go ahead and let's take a look. And we have New Oaks Winery requires two months to make wine, two years to age it, one month to bottle it. If that's the case, let's just drink beer. <laughs> Take that one. Okay. So we have what? Winery requires two months to what? Make the wine. Two years to what? I'm going to put my months over here. Two years to what? Age it. One month to bottle it. Two months to sell it. Two months to sell it, and one month to what? Collect the receivable. So this all adds up to what? To um, the amount of time to turn the inventory into cash, which is the operating cycle. Okay. So I guess I can go ahead and turn this into what? 24 months. So does that add up? I hope to uh, 30 months. How long did it take them to turn their inventory into cash, right? Was the operating cycle, okay? So if you've got an asset that you expect to last one year, a year and three months, is it current or non-current? You've got an asset that you think is going to last a year and three months, whatever. Is it current or non-current? In this, in this question, it is what? It is current because what? It's one year or the operating cycle, whichever is longer, and the operating cycle is longer than one year here, isn't it? It's 30 months. Okay. Question? Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's look at non-current assets. Usually these are that are going to exceed the one year or exceed the operating cycle period, long-term investments, property, plant, equipment, intangible assets. Anyone got an example of an intangible asset? Patent. Purchase patent. Good. It's got to be purchased from a third party, right? The cost of developing a patent is expensed, right? But if it's purchased from a third party, good. Do you amortize that? Absolutely, you amortize that. You amortize that over the shorter of the useful life or 17 years, right? For a patent. Okay. All right, good. How about goodwill? Is that an, a uh, is that a uh, intangible? Goodwill is an intangible asset, right? You go to a restaurant and, you know, the place is a dump. The seats are all busted up. Thinking of 
a place I go to all the time. The equipment's all busted up. The bathrooms, you can barely stand to look at them, right? And so what happens? You say, oh, why did my why did my date bring me here? This is awful, right? And then you taste the food and you go, oh, they really love me. This is great. I'm in love, right? Okay. So you call the owner over and you say, hmm, looking around here, you probably got about $10,000 worth of assets. I'll give you $10,000 for the place. The owner says, security, security, throw this person out, right? Because they know that what? They should be selling you that for $10 million because there's this line out the door of all these people that want to, um, you know, want to eat the food there, right? It's potential revenue, etc. So when the current owner prepares the balance sheet, Shouldn't they put, no, I forgot the number, $10 million of goodwill, whatever? Should they put $10 million of goodwill in there? No. no, because what? They did not acquire that from a third party. All in value of all intangibles like patents, copyrights, etc., have to be acquired from what? From a third party, don't they? Okay. Now, what happens? Let's say you pony up. And you say, okay, here's the $10 billion. Now, you have acquired from a third party. So when you prepare your first balance sheet for that company, you will show the $10 million of goodwill, won't you? Now, over what period should you depreciate your goodwill? You do not depreciate goodwill. Because goodwill could go on forever. Look at Minnie and Mickey and Minnie. Who knew how long that marriage would last, right? Everybody loves Mickey and Minnie. There's always going to be that goodwill there, right? Okay, unless somehow Donald Duck gets involved and ruins the whole thing. Okay, but we'll assume everything's going to be great, right? Now, what happens if one day you're making pancakes in the restaurant, whatever, and you accidentally spill some Clorox? in the pancakes and a bunch of people are out on the sidewalk ah! now what is your goodwill still 10 million you know the channel 2 news is out there joey's pancakes made a bunch of people sick and the fda is investigating and blah 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 now what now we would have the situation where there could be an impairment to the goodwill we'd have to write down that goodwill We'd have to write down that goodwill to, and we write it all the way down to zero if it's completely destroyed. So if you you can you can make goodwill not goodwill all the way down to zero. With me so far. Now let's say that I take over this place and I say, you know what? I'm gonna put mouse ears on every one of my pancakes, and I'm gonna. Well, you probably couldn't do that because then Disney would sue you. But I'm going to put, you know, whipped cream on all the pancakes. And so that everybody will, you know, now I'll be, I'm going to make my goodwill gooder. I'm going to do an advertising campaign. It says, come Sunday, we got whipped cream and we got Daisy the Clown here. Should I write up the goodwill? You cannot make goodwill gooder. You can only do what? I'm saying it wrong on purpose. You cannot make goodwill gooder. You have to what? You have to acquire that from a third party, don't you? Okay, so that's sort of how in general intangibles work. Yes, sir. So, so the goodwill amount uh, may the same when you first acquired as well, but it has the same value to every dollar? The person who created the goodwill doesn't have any goodwill. Okay. So when we purchase the assets... We bring, let's say the fair market value of the assets is 10000 and we purchase the place for $10,000,000, $10,000,000, yeah. okay, and we buy, say, their stock, whatever, when we purchase it. Just to make it simple, the uh, stock would be what? Would be the uh, $10,000,000, $10,000,000. On the balance sheet, assets would be 10000 and then goodwill would be $10 million. That person only had assets of, and they would be having them at cost, whatever they paid for them, maybe 2000 however many years ago. They take their cash, they run their financial reporting days for this business is over, and we carry over the $10 million goodwill. Okay, that's a consolidation issue beyond intermediate one and two. Okay, so that process that I just gave you. Uh, you know, consolidation expert would probably have had a heart attack just now hearing what I said, but just to make, keep it a little bit simple. The once we had when we dumped the Clorox in the pancakes, uh, we would have to let's say it got impaired, you know, you know, obvious silly example, but let's say there was an impairment of um, 
of say, um, I don't know, 2000. We would go ahead and debit loss on impairment of goodwill. Goes on the income statement, we credit the goodwill account. I'm just making, uh, well, what you do is you have to test a goodwill for impairment each period. So you go through a process, and companies have to do this, and I'm sure they love it. You have to go through a process to figure out what is the fair value of all your assets and liabilities. Any amount that's left over beyond the fair value of the assets and liabilities above net value that's left over above the assets above the liabilities, fair value of the assets above the fair value of the liabilities, must be goodwill, right? If I'm saying fair value of my assets is 100000 fair value of my liabilities is 80000 so I got a value there of 20000 What's it attributable to? Got to be the plug, if you will, the goodwill. And so the goodwill is 20000 I look at the goodwill that's carried on the balance sheet. If the goodwill that's carried on the balance sheet is, say, 30000 now I have an impairment of my goodwill. And so I would debit the loss, credit the goodwill to bring it down to the 20000 And companies are required to do that at least annually. Yeah, it's kind of a convoluted process. Companies, I'm sure, hate that. That's probably like... Okay, are we ready to issue the financial statements? Well, no, we got to do the goodwill impairment calculation because you would have done all your accounting and everything up until that point. Okay, long-term investments, investment in securities, investment in tangible fixed assets, okay? Um, of tangible fixed assets not used in the operations, you can have that. Special funds, investments in non-consolidated subsidiaries. Um, there's two methods to account for investment in securities. One is called the equity method. One is called the cost method. And we'll talk about those more in Chapter 12. Okay. And so you can see what the property, plant, and equipment section of the balance sheet might look like. Land, buildings capitalized leases you get to in chapter and I keep saying chapter and in intermediate two. What's a leasehold improvement? Huh? Innovation? Renovation, yes. Innovation goes where? Goes on the income statement as money spent, right? Research and development. The reason uh, Tesla has a huge net loss period after period is their research and development line item is expense. But yes, um, renovation to lease property. So I change all the lights in a building that I'm leasing. That is an asset to me, right? Because I have put all those improvements in there. Now, like any asset, you have to depreciate it. And you depreciate leasehold improvements over the, uh, sh over the shorter of the lease period or the life of the asset, whatever it is. So if the lights are going to last 10 years, my lease is 12 years, I'll amortize that over what? 10 years. If the lights have 12-year life, but the lease has a 10-year life, well, I'm going to be gone by the time the lights are fully depreciated. So I depreciate over 10 years in that case. Question, sir? Huh? If you do something to like uh, well, tell the well. I'm not talking about light bulbs, guys. I'm talking about you know light fixtures. Um, and tell your le your landlord to mind their own business about their financial report because they, at that point, are showing nothing but rental property, and they're showing it their cost. And they're depreciating that rental property at their cost. And I don't care if you're putting golden light, you know, uh, diamond lights. You know, well, we, uh, we rely on the sunlight bouncing off the diamonds that we installed on the ceiling for lighting. Um, it's none of their business. Okay. You would still report a leasehold improvement. Okay. Now, having said that, since you're treating that as some sort of equipment, because diamonds could be carried at their fair market value, but if you've used them as equipment, I guess you would put them in. Your leasehold improvement goes in at cost, of course, what your cost was, and that's what you amortize over the shorter of the lease period or the life of the actual improvement. 
Things like diamonds, you can carry at fair market value. So if you were using diamonds as lights, I'm not sure there if you would use that as cost at fair value, but who would do that? So tell the landlord to mind their own business. I thought I saw something back there. No? Okay. Okay, good. Where are we? We still got time, guys. Don't start putting your stuff away yet. Okay? All right. Um, liens against the property have to be what? Disclosed. What's a lien? And don't say, is that some guy that, you know, hangs out and smokes a cigarette out in front of my building all the time? What's a lien? It's a claim against the title of you of the uh, property that you have, right? For example, let's say I have accounts receivable and I need a little cash. So I go to what they call a factor for those accounts receivable and I say, hey, if give me some money and if my uh, customers don't pay you, you can come back and uh, have my accounts receivable. So I've pledged my account receivable as collateral, haven't I? And so now there's a lien against that account receivable, and I would have to disclose in the notes to my financial statements that there's this potential what? Liability against the accounts receivable, okay? Now I do that when I have a, what they call a recourse um, factoring of my account receivable. There's also something called a non-recourse factoring, and with a non-recourse factoring, they can't come back to me if they don't collect. Ha ha ha! ha too bad. Under that circumstance, though, I'm going to show the cash, and instead of showing a liability for that lien, I will just simply take the account receivable off the books because they can't come back to me, and I've sold that receivable. Now, of course, I'll sell the receivable for less than their carrying value, right? Because the factor's got to eat too. Okay, good. Intangibles, we've sort of talked about. Other assets, whatever. I don't care about these things now. Okay, liabilities, current and non current. Okay, working capital. Good, let's look at this. How do we define working capital? Definition. It's an equation, not words. Working capital. Oh, sorry. It's Come on now. Make it fun. Current assets minus current liabilities equals what? Working capital. Okay, good. Can we turn this into a ratio? Well, let me ask you a different question. Do you want a positive? You want this to be a positive number or a negative number? Got to be a positive number because if it's negative, that's telling what? telling us that we don't have the money to pay things that are currently coming due. That's very bad, right? Okay. Okay. Now, can we turn this into a ratio? Go ahead. Can we turn this into a ratio? Go ahead. Try again. You're on the right track. Turn yourself. Stand. Can you stand on your hands? Turn yourself upside down. <laughs> Isn't that what you said the first time? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. S don't turn over. Hey, you guys listening, he actually turned over. Okay. Current assets divided by what? Current lot. See what you missed? So get to class. You're missing people doing somersaults. Current assets divided by current liabilities equals what? Equals the current ratio. Good. Okay, current ratio. Do we want that current ratio to be negative or positive? I mean, uh, greater than one or less than one? Greater than one. Good. Do you want it to be like 50 to one? It starts to get to a point where it's so large that you start to say, well, wait a minute. We have a company that's mismanaging their financial position because they're holding way more current assets than would be necessary to meet the current liabilities. So we like a nice, healthy current ratio, three, four. But if it starts to get so big, you say, well, wait a minute. Shouldn't we be taking some of those current assets and putting them into something that's a little more productive, like maybe a longer-term investment or something like that? Okay. Okay, good. So you've got that ratio. And we're going to talk more about some of the ratios associated with current liabilities and current um, assets here in a second.
Some of these slides are a little, I don't care about them. Okay, capital stock, additional paid in capital in excess of par. We talked about the other day. We refreshed our memory on that a little bit. And what? Retained earnings. Okay. Okay, good. Um, I'll tell you what. I'm trying to rush here because we're running out of time. So what we'll do is we're going to cool the jets. We're going to go ahead and we're going to get into supplemental disclosure forward next time. So we'll finish Chapter 3 next time and we'll get to the quiz next time. So do me a favor. You should be in good si – Chapter 3 – quiz next time you should be in pretty good shape right now though to start to look at that quiz even on your own so that when we hit the ground with that next time you've got some questions and that kind of stuff we'll work through that and we'll just continue on the march through the chapters all right if you did not uh sign in guys please do that the sign in sheet i'll put right up here in the front okay and i will see you next time